Hello everyone, thank you for being here on this beautiful day. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the Danforth Center and especially Mary Griffith, uh, the director of the center, who uh, organized this together with me and without whose help and support we could not have done this event. And I also want to thank uh, our outstanding administrators in Jewish Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies and in the, and in the Danforth Center, Julia Clay and Deborah Kennard, uh, whose work and attention to detail from travel arrangements to publicity to last minute changes um, also make it possible for us to be in this room today. Uh, I have to apologize. Uh, I, said we, I said that there would be a reception right after the talk, uh, but we had we had to change that uh, in deference to the um, Jewish holiday of Purim that starts at 6.30. So I apologize about that. We'll, we'll make up for the reception another time. Um, Laura Levitt is professor of religion, Jewish studies, and gender at Temple University, where she has chaired the religion department and directed both the Jewish studies and the gender, sexuality, and women's studies programs. She's the author of numerous books and articles that have shaped the fields of American Jewish studies, Holocaust studies, uh, and feminism. Her first book she published in 1997, Jews and Feminism, The Ambivalent Search for Home, uh, explores uh, immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe to America and their desire to make this country their permanent home. She raises questions about the search for stability in specific Jewish religious and cultural traditions and links these questions to the liberal academy and feminist study, thus offering an account of an ambivalent Jewish feminist embrace of America as a home. This book crosses boundaries and breaks rules to provide a visionary possibility for feminist Jewish cultural studies and it juxtaposes theology, a feminist analysis of liberalism and a Jewish cultural analysis of emancipation to construct an original reading of being a Jew and a Jewish woman in America. In her next book, American Jewish Laws After the Holocaust, published in 2003, um, Professor Levitt turned to the complicated subject of the legacy of the Holocaust in America. Starting from her experience as an American Jew whose family was not directly affected by the Holocaust, Levitt uh, grapples with the challenges of contending with ordinary Jewish laws. She suggests that although the memory of the Holocaust may seem to overshadow all other kinds of loss for American Jews, it can also open up possibilities for engaging these more personal and everyday legacies. And it's a book that, as you'll see in a little bit, foreshadows uh, her work in her latest book, The Object That Remain, uh, which we'll hear about in a few moments. In addition to her books, Professor Levitt is the editor of the North American Religion Book Series, published by NYU Press. She has co-edited two collections of articles, one on Judaism since gender and the other on contemporary art since the Holocaust. In addition to that, she wrote many, many scholarly articles, and if I had to speak about all of them, we'd be here until tomorrow morning because her CV is 40 pages long. So I just end on a personal note to say that uh, Laura Levitt is not only a scholar of feminism, but also a steadfast supporter of women and queer scholars in academia. I've seen her work in the Association for Jewish Studies, Women's Caucus, and, and different AJS committees, um, always uh, fiercely and, and thoughtfully to advocate uh, for everybody in the association. And so I want to honor not only her scholarship, but also her work. Uh, as a feminist and advocate of uh, so many scholars who would call her a mentor. So please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Levitt. Um, it's really an honor to be here and to be with um, so many of you um, who I've either gotten to meet today, some of you who I know from very different places, and it's like that, that dreamlike thing that happens sometimes when um, you're, to get, you're at a gathering, an academic gathering. So it's or a little bit like Facebook where like all these people who wouldn't normally be together are together and it's kind of lovely and wonderful. So um, it's really a delight to be among all of you and um, thank you for coming to this talk. And uh, so I'm gonna proceed. Uh, I, this is um, a written, a written um, presentation and I will kind of look up and I'll make digressions, but I really 
want to make sure that I kind of get to the points and so um, I, I hope to be reading in a more animated fashion but um, given the context the content I really wanted to make sure that I do this right so um, uh, that's what's going to be before you um, okay uh, and I think this slide will will be a little more um, understandable kind of as I get going um, uh, but this is from my my current office at home and it's one of my bookshelves um, and the painting is my father's and um, that is Joe Biden being kissed by my mother and next to my father I'm from Delaware and it's a Delaware thing so um, uh, whatever you might think of the president but he is from Delaware okay and they're not a lot of us okay let me get started okay you got 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 the herb there Okay, so I begin with this quote, which is um, the epigraph for the book, and it's from Maggie Nelson's The Red Parts, and I'm going to read it, and I'm going to just have it up here for a little bit for you to meditate on, um, and in some ways it is um, really central to some of what I'm thinking about and what I hope to be talking about today. A sudden death is one way, a terrible way, I suppose, of freezing the details of a life. While writing Jane, I became amazed by the way that one act of violence had transformed an array of everyday items, a raincoat, a pair of pantyhose, a paperback book, a wool jumper, into numbered pieces of evidence, into talismans that threaten at every turn to take on allegorical proportions. In part, this, this talk returns to the ordinary to ask what paying attention to such transformed objects might teach us about our everyday possessions what we hold on to and what we let go. I'm interested in exploring with you today part of what it meant for me to have spent over 10 years working through the ways objects brushed by violence take hold of us and demand our attention. That's on the one hand. And why perhaps it was only after completing my book, The Objects That Remain, that I was able to return to the question of ordinary objects. Having written this book, I found myself able to sort through and let go of not only my childhood home and its contents, but also my own home, the place where I had lived for most of my professional life. I'm not arguing that only tainted objects deserve our attention, or that we can and must somehow let go of too much stuff. Rather, what I want to suggest is that only by attending to my own abiding love for things and the terrible legacy of my own lost evidence, could I begin to appreciate what it meant to have choices, to be able to decide what to do with our possessions? What I want to argue is that in everyday life, we have options. We can find new homes for things we still care about. We can give them away or sell them to those who might enjoy, care for, or even love them, even as we might throw away still other things. And in ordinary life, we can and do have the ability to choose what we decide to carry with us and what we take into the next chapter or chapters of our lives. When I first began writing about these things uh, for this talk, um, I got stuck. I, it felt as if I was painting a stark contrast between holding on and letting go. But this was not what I experienced. Yes, I could let go of, for example, most of my parents' things, furniture, 